What's up, everybody? So I got some really good reviews for that elementary school presentation that I did, where it was the video and the PowerPoint all about insects and, you know, kind of an intro to entomology for kids. And so that gave me this idea to start recording the CEU sessions that I do for our company, uh, which just stands for Continuing Education Units. And that's something that pest control providers have to do in order to keep their license, is get a certain number of hours of training each year. But I figured this was knowledge that not just pest control providers could use, but everybody could use. Uh, these are things that I think everybody could benefit from knowing, and I really hope people get some enjoyment out of them. I know that uh, I really enjoy teaching. It's one of the big passions of mine. And so getting to spread that knowledge to more people than just the people in my company is a fantastic idea in my mind. Like, I love the idea of many different people getting to learn from my video. I will say, in certain areas, the audio does kind of chop and, you know, lag, and the PowerPoint can get kind of blurry, and that has to do with the platform on which I was presenting. Uh, so I was giving a Google Hangout presentation to everybody in the company, and because of that, it took the PowerPoint and the video and the audio kind of all separately and put them together into one cohesive uh, recording of my presentation. Uh, all of the content is still there, though it does kind of get hard to hear in a, a couple places, you still get the overall idea. I think it's really good content and you get something out of it, uh, but please let me know what you think. Feel free to reach out to me with any questions you might have after you watch it, and uh, look for more of this to come in the future. All right, so yeah, I'm going to talk about destroying beetles today. Uh, keep in mind, this plays into everything that we've been talking about so far. So we talked about wood decaying fungus, we talked about moisture issues, uh, and we talked about termites. <clears throat> Some of those actually play into wood destroying beetles. Uh, so fungus can actually kind of aid a wood destroying beetle infestation, and it can actually help it thrive in certain cases. Of, cur of course, moisture is going to be an issue when you're dealing with wood destroying beetles. And that's one of the things that we actually have to worry about when dealing with wood destroying beetles is controlling that moisture. Uh, and that's one of the things that I'll talk about later on in the slides. Um, so what do you see in this image? So feel free to unmute yourself, somebody, or, you know, call out. What do you see here? A log cabin. A log Ooh. cabin. All right. Yeah, so most people would say something like a very nice log home, a log cabin, wood, uh, something of the sorts. Yeah, I mean, those are the answers that we expect, especially from customers. Like if somebody drives by something like this and they're just riding down an old country road, you know, they're, they're probably going to be in awe. And that's like a dream home for a lot of people. It's a beautiful house. Uh, but as pest control professionals, we see a wood-destroying organism paradise. So we know that wood-destroying organisms love log cabins. Uh, that is one of the, the many, many issues uh, that can come along with log cabins. As beautiful as they are, wood-destroying organisms love them. It's a safe haven for wood destroying organisms. And so that's why it's really hard to sometimes put a bond or a guarantee on a lot of log cabins is because they are so conducive to a lot of different wood destroying organisms because of all of that wood that's present. I mean, it is nothing but wood, um, especially uh, depending on the area, like up in North Georgia or something like that, uh, where we do have more humid temperatures and we have more moisture in the air. I remember we talked about relative humidity and dew point and things like that in an earlier PowerPoint. That would be a serious issue here. Uh, you notice it's on a crawl space. You can see a crawl vent right there. And so any moisture that's in that crawl space is going to lead to some sort of wood destroying organism over time. In Georgia, it's not a matter of like if you get that wood destroying organism, but remember I said when you get that wood destroying organism. All right, so well, log homes are an obvious WDO concern. We obviously know wood siding and log homes and things like that are WDO concerns. We have to remember those not so obvious issues. So a lot of wood boring beetles are wood destroying beetles that we deal with. And a lot of dry wood termite infestations a lot of times usually start with something that's not uh, so obvious. It's not from the outside, it's actually in furniture. So you have old wooden chests, you have all different types of wooden furniture. You have dressers, armoires, uh, bookshelves, tables, rocking horses. There are thousands of different types of wooden furniture. And depending on the type of wood they're built out of and the type of material that was used, you can have a whole slew of different wood destroying organisms you might have to deal with. And then of course, hardwood floors. And the wood destroying organisms that are gonna attack hardwood floors, nine times out of 10, unless it's 
termites that have come up from underneath the house or under the slab, there's not a lot that we can do for the wood-destroying organisms in hardwood floors. And we'll talk more about that later on in the PowerPoint. So what can damage or infest wood besides termites? Well, obviously we have fungus. We talked about white rot, brown rot, uh, poria and crassata, which is that water conducting fungi that can be some seriously bad news. Uh, you have carpenter ants and other species of ants. Uh, there are uh, some ants, not necessarily in the United States, but in other countries that can attack wood and nest within wood. And carpenter ants are gonna be the main culprit here. And remember, I've said before, that is damaged moist wood, it's, you know, kind of soft wood, it's not going to be dry structural wood that carpenter ants are nesting in. And there's kind of that miscommunication there amongst a lot of people that carpenter ants eat wood, and that's not the case. Remember, they don't eat wood, they nest in wood. And then we have carpenter bees, which also don't eat wood, they nest in wood, uh, they bore the hole, they crawl inside and down through here, there would be a gallery. And in that gallery, there's little packets of pollen, little balls of pollen. And on those pollen balls is where they lay their eggs. And then they cap off each cell. And then the next season, all the, the larvae have pupated, they hatch as adults, and go and create their own nests and mate and restart that infestation. And then the subject of, you know, today's lesson are wood destroying beetles. Remember, there are, you know, cosmetic or aesthetic wood destroying beetles like blue crested borers or jewel beetles, as people call them. And we'll talk more about those if you don't know what they are. Or you have lictids, which damage hardwoods. And then you have your wood destroying beetles that cause structural issues. So you have powder post beetles and the old house borer uh, are the main beetles of concern there. Uh, give me one second, I'm gonna take my sweater off. It's a little warm. All right. <clears throat> All right, so today's focus, of course, like I said, is the wood-destroying beetles. But before you can understand wood-destroying beetles or wood-destroying organisms in general, we have to have an understanding of the wood that they're infesting. Uh, if we don't know a lot about wood or how the composition of wood works or what it's made up of or, you know, issues that are associated with it, then we don't really know how to control those wood-destroying pests. Uh, you know, we have to start with the most basic level, which is we need to know the biology of what they're infesting to understand the biology of those pests. So what factors affect pest attraction to wood? So we have to remember that wood destroying pests or wood destroying organisms aren't attracted to wood just because it's wood. And they don't care that it's wood, they're influenced by factors in the wood or factors of the wood. Uh, so moisture content of the wood, how much moisture is in that wood, and there are different processes that we go through when prepping lumber for building and things like that to remove a lot of that moisture. And most times that's where most beetles get into wood. And then they're there through the drying process. That lumber is sold to builders or you know stores. It's used in our homes. And those beetles are built right into our homes. This happens a ton with hardwood floors. Lictid larvae are in those hardwood floors. They go through the drying process. And by the time they get built into the home, they start emerging. And that's when somebody notices they really have an infestation. It's not just something that came in from the outside. It was actually built into the house. Uh, you have other factors that play into it as well. So you have the age of the wood, uh, the type of cut, which I'll explain a little bit more about. That's not as obvious as you might think. It's not as simple as it actually sounds. And then you have the, the tree species, the type of species that we're dealing with. And I'll you know, get into that more in a couple slides. So each factor acts like a small piece of the puzzle, and all of those pieces fit together to show us the big picture. They give us a better understanding of what's actually going on and the biology of these wood-destroying pests. So we're going to look at the pieces of the puzzle. So we'll look at the pieces we're dealing with, so to speak. And then we'll think about it, and we'll look at the overarching theme here, and we'll see how all those factors of the puzzle play into controlling these wood infesting organisms or preventing these wood infesting organisms in the first place. So moisture content. The moisture content of freshly cut wood is greater than or equal to 40%, usually somewhere in the 40s. Uh, the moisture content of construction grade wood is between 8 to 12%. That means in order to get a fresh cut piece of lumber to construction grade or you know wood that is ready to be built with, 28% of the moisture has to be removed. How are we going to do that? Uh, so I don't know if anybody in here is familiar with wood drying processes. 
uh, feel free to unmute. I'll give, you know, 10, 15 seconds. Anybody want to take a guess at how we dry some of that or take some of that moisture out of the wood or dry that wood out? Kiln dry. Okay. I think that went. That's kiln dry is one way. Anybody else know there's another main way? Anybody else know it? Pressure treated. So pressure treated doesn't remove the moisture. What we're doing there is actually taking a piece of wood, putting it in basically a vacuum with borate, and we're actually putting it under immense pressure, forcing that borate into the wood. So we've already removed the moisture, and now we're actually technically adding it back in, but we're adding it back in with a borate added. So as the pests crawl through that wood and burrow through it and chew and do damage, they're actually ingesting those borates. The other method is kind of simple and a lot more obvious than I think any of us really think about. I don't think about this half the time. It's just air drying. It's just leaving it sitting out in big stacks, you know, stacked up on top of each other, letting the air dry it out. Uh, and that is the most dangerous way to dry wood to prep it for construction. Air drying uh, is when a lot of our wood destroying organisms actually get into that wood. All right, so dried by air or dried by a lumber kiln. Uh, this is the back of the lumber kiln. On the other side, of course, there's a big opening. You stack all the lumber in here and then it heats it up. And there's a lot of science that goes into it that I'm not going to bore you with. And then, like I said, air drying. They stack it up. They leave gaps in between it so that it can get good airflow. And it's just left out to, to dry, excuse me, to dry out. Uh, brick makers actually do the same thing when they're making uh, brand new bricks. If they don't kiln dry the bricks, uh, in Georgia, this doesn't work because it's so humid and air drying lumber is kind of hard to do in Georgia too because of the humidity in the air. But, uh, you know, brick makers in like Arizona and stuff, they'll just leave the bricks sitting out in the desert for five, six months and it'll, it'll dry them out and they get as, as hard as stone. So uh, pretty cool. Two different ways that we do it. Mainly in Georgia, it'll be more of a, a kiln dried process just because, like I said, that humidity in the air makes drying by air just almost an impossible task. All right, so each drying method, of course, has pros and cons. Well, to better understand these pros and cons, we have to actually better understand tree species because the different types of tree species are going to have different pros and cons associated with each drying method. And so I'll get into that and what I actually mean by that in just a couple seconds. But this is yet another factor of pest attraction. So remember, we had moisture, we had tree species, we had age, we had type of cut. And so now we're going to get into the tree species and we'll come back to the drying methods. So what are the different tree categories? Uh, so trees can be lumped into two main overarching categories and each category will contain numerous species. So the two categories, the overarching categories are hardwoods and softwoods. And now we need to delve a little deeper, dive a little deeper and, and look at what each category actually means. What does it mean when I say hardwood? Or what does it mean when I say softwood? So what are hardwoods? So trees with broad leaves that shed their leaves every fall are considered hardwoods. Uh, so some examples around here are oak, maple, and hickory. Now, hardwoods that are used in the sense of, you know, building and what we're thinking about in, in this sense, for oak trees, there are numerous species of hardwoods that are used. Uh, if you look at hardwood flooring, this is the perfect example of the vast number of hardwoods that are actually out there. And then there's probably 40 different types of oak floors. Uh, there's two different main species of maple trees that are used and about eight species of hickory. And each one of these different species of trees has its own pests that'll attack it. It has its own pros and its own cons. And then uh, bamboo is defined as a hardwood, but it's actually a type of grass. So we lump bamboo in with hardwood floors and things like that, uh, but bamboos are actually just a long, tall piece of grass uh, that has a harder outer shell, and they have their own pests uh, called bamboo borers, and there are some other pests that attack strictly bamboo. So uh, there are a wide variety of pests that can attack different hardwoods. Now, on the flip side, we have softwoods. So what are softwoods? That's trees with needles. Uh, they retain their needles year round. We would call those evergreens. Uh, and there are examples of softwood species like pine. Two main species that are used, loblolly is the most commonly used uh, for construction or building. So a lot of the houses that we have built from loblolly pine. But softwoods don't make a very good uh, building wood for 
a lot of furniture and flooring and stuff like that because of their structure. So instead, they're used as building material. They make perfect building material. You also can't burn a lot of softwoods uh, because they can actually leave a residue in the fireplace that can kind of start a secondary fire after the fact. It builds up in the, the chimney. It's a deposit that can actually cause fires up in the, the chimney or the flue. Uh, so not safe to burn them. Don't make great building material for furniture or floors. So we'll just use it for construction. Uh, spruce, there's about four species that can be used in fir. Uh, there's one species, the Douglas fir. Uh, fir trees are usually Christmas trees. And if you know anything about Christmas trees, if you let them dry out and die and you leave your Christmas lights on them, they will catch fire like that. I mean, Christmas lights get hot enough that they can set an old dead Christmas tree on fire pretty much after, effortlessly. Uh, so imagine using something like that in a fireplace and you, you get an idea of why we don't burn things like soft woods. All right, so how do we use hardwoods? I already said we use it for flooring, furniture, and what a lot of people don't know is shipping pellets. So a lot of shipping pellets are actually made from uh, oak hardwood and it serves as a really good wood for shipping pellets. And then those shipping pellets, people who repurpose shipping pellets, you know, they make um, furniture or, you know, special uh, knickknacks and things like that, a little decor out of shipping pellets. Uh, those actually have a lot of wood destroying problems and wood destroying beetles, sorry, wood destroying organism problems like beetles associated with them. Uh, because they get into those shipping pellets, they're not really treated because why are we going to treat something that we're just putting stuff on to ship for a very brief amount of time and then throw away? Uh, and so when they get repurposed, if it's not treated properly and it's not inspected properly, a lot of times those wood destroying beetles can actually be shipped in those, those knickknacks or the decor that's been built with the shipping pallets. Uh, and I actually have a story about that that I'll tell you all about in just a little bit. All right, so how do we use softwoods? Like I said, it's used for building material, building or construction material. Uh, it's used as two by fours, four by fours, all sorts. All right, branching back to drying methods. I bet y'all thought I was going to leaf you hanging there. And sorry, it's a little early for puns, but who doesn't love them? All right, how do the drying methods affect softwoods? So both air drying and kiln drying affect softwoods in the same way. What it does is it concentrates the carbohydrates and the sugars, also known as the nutritional value of the wood, into the outer wood surface. Okay, big whoop, what does that mean? Who cares? Well, it's an issue because it provides a fantastic food source for the early stages of wood-destroying beetle larva. So those carbohydrates and sugars, when they get concentrated to the outer wood surface, where those beetle larvae are going to be burrowing through, doing their damage, eating the interior of that piece of wood, that is a nutrient-rich food source. So air drying and kiln drying are both concerns when using soft wood. So what do we do to try to combat that? I think Vince mentioned this. We use pressure treatment. We take those soft woods, we put them in that big machine I was telling you about, and we force borate or some other similar type of chemical into the wood. That's what gives it that green texture, or green color, sorry. Uh, green coloration is the chemical that's been pressure treated into the wood. And the reason that it has that coloration, most borates and other chemicals that act like borates are actually colorless. And so what they do is they add a dye to them so that you know that the wood's been pressure treated. And if you look at the piece of wood, if it's been pressure treated properly and you have a thorough treatment, when you look at the side of the two by four, you should see that coloration all the way through the piece of wood. Sometimes if it's been sitting there a while and it's dried out or uh, if you look and it wasn't properly pressure treated or didn't get left in the machine for quite long enough or all sorts of things, enough chemical didn't get added when they were pressure treating it, you can actually see a thin gap in the middle of a piece of wood where the pressure treatment wasn't all the way through or didn't make it all the way through. And so that wood would be more susceptible to wood destroying organisms than a piece of wood that was colored all the way across the side. All right, how does each of the drying methods affect hardwoods? So air drying eliminates many of the starches and carbohydrates from dry woods and it leaves the wood less susceptible to attack but it takes a longer amount of time. The issue with that long amount of time that it takes is while it is air drying and until those starches and carbohydrates get eliminated, that wood is susceptible to wood destroying organisms. And that's where our licted powder post beetles get inside the wood. 
And now you'll learn in just a few slides, liquids have very low moisture requirements. So even after the wood is done air drying, a lot of times it's not, the, not enough of the moisture has been removed to get rid of that lictid infestation. Those hardwoods get used as flooring, the lictids are still there, and they finish their life cycle and start emerging. And that's when somebody notices they have a problem. When they notice the little piles of sawdust, the holes in their floor, and possibly even little beetles crawling around, they realize, uh-oh, I have infested hardwood floors. On the flip side, conversely, we have kiln drying. Now that leaves the car starches and carbohydrates intact and leaves the wood more susceptible to attack. Now it is better for, the th for things like lictids in the sense that if we kiln dry the wood first and use it directly after for hardwood flooring, uh, it is a perfect way to get rid of lictids. We kiln dry it, it kills any lictids that are already there, it gets hot, and it's like a heat treatment, uh, it removes all the moisture, and then we build those, those hardwoods, use those hardwoods to build floors, and the lictid infestation isn't there. The issue is a lot of times after we kiln dry wood, we kiln dry so much of it at a time, that it just gets stacked up in a warehouse and it gets left there until somebody comes through and buys it. Well, because those starches and carbohydrates are intact and because lictids have such low moisture requirements, if they were to get into that facility and if they were to find those stacks of hardwood that were kiln dried, those stacks of kiln dried hardwood would still be susceptible to lictid attack because there's a perfect nutritional food source and they're not treated with anything. Now, using things like varnish or stain or paint or something like that on hardwoods, uh, you know, those people, crazy people who paint beautiful hardwoods, uh, that can actually stop lictid infestations from happening, but they're not going to do that prior to the hardwood floors being installed. And so you run into a lot of the same issues with lictids in both air drying and kiln drying. Uh, a lot of times kiln drying is, is picked over air drying because it's a much quicker process and the wood is ready for sale much quicker than it is by air drying. So each one comes with pros and cons. You just have to keep that in mind as we're going through this lesson, and you can really see how those pros and cons you know, come into play when we start actually talking about these beetles in a few slides. All right, so another factor is the age of the wood. How can we determine the age of a tree? So does anybody know how we do that? How do we know how old a tree is? The based on the rings. Yes, exactly. It's based on the rings. You look at the rings of the tree. Now, if you look at a piece of lumber that's been cut from a tree, you can see the remnants of the rings. Of course, we can't know how old that piece of lumber is because we don't know what the rings look like beyond that, but it gives us a good idea if it's spring wood, if it's summer wood, uh, things like that, and you'll learn what that means in a minute. So, you look at its growth rings. So, this tree, I went ahead and counted all these rings. This tree would be about 20 years old. So from dark line to dark line would be a ring. And it actually tells us more looking at rings than you might imagine. So in the very center, this very, very dark condensed ring, that would be the first year of growth. That's when it'd be a sapling and it would be growing. There's not much uh, nutritional value to it. Now, during a rainy season, you get bigger, thicker rings because the tree is, is flourishing. It's doing a lot better. In dry seasons, you have uh, thinner, smaller rings. And then you can actually tell if a tree's been through a forest fire by looking for scars. So if you notice scars in the rings, then you can tell if it's, it's been through a forest fire. And something to keep in mind about that, if you have a very rainy season and you have a piece of lumber that has very big rings, there's going to be more nutrients in here than if you have lumber that's gone through a very dry season. And so looking at that when you're, you're choosing lumber from the store, you know, how big are the rings that are actually there? Are they tightly packed or are they big and spread out? It can also tell you how susceptible that wood might be to attack. There's also something else that we can tell from looking at the growth rings of a tree. What else can we tell? Heartwood versus sapwood. So heartwood is the dark wood in the center of this tree or the center of this log and sapwood is the lighter colored wood along the outer ring of this log. And again, big whoop, what does that mean? So heartwood characteristics are darker in color. It's comprised of much older annual rings. So what you have to think about, that's the oldest part of the tree. This heartwood is gonna be the first 10 or 15 years of this tree's life, while this outer sapwood is gonna be the last 
five years of this tree's life. So there's a lot more nutritional value in the sapwood than there is the heartwood. There's not much in the way of nutrition because the longer the wood sits, the more it loses those starches and carbohydrates and other nutritional components that are actually in the wood. And so the heart wood is usually less susceptible to, to attack, but it's impossible to get lumber built strictly from nothing but heart wood. And so soft or sap wood, sorry, is lighter in color. It's comprised of the newer rings of the tree, and it has a very high nutritional value. Um, because of that, it's very susceptible to damage or attack. And that's something that we have to keep in mind when we're in somebody's crawl space. Most of the wood in a crawl space is going to be sap wood. It would be very expensive to buy nothing but heartwood lumber. Uh, heartwood lumber, you know, you might see advertised, oh, this is heartwood pine. And if you look at heartwood pine, it tends to be more expensive than some of the other pine that's out there. And that's because it's less susceptible to damage or attack. And unless you're rolling in the dough, it would be crazy expensive to build a house out of nothing but heartwood. And so we have to we have to keep that in mind when we're inspecting crawl spaces. We're looking at sapwood, which means it's going to be susceptible to attack, which means we need to do a very thorough and genuine inspection. So telling the tale of time, older wood means fewer nutrients. Fewer nutrients means less nutritional value, and less nutritional value means the wood's less likely to be attacked. So when I say the age of the wood plays into the, the factors that influence wood destroying organisms, that's what I'm talking about. The older the wood or the longer the wood has to age, the better off we are, because we know that most WDOs attack younger wood. Even if we don't have hardwood, if we let sap wood sit for long enough, it becomes less susceptible to WDO attack over time. And so that's another reason that, you know, they may air dry or kill and dry these pieces of lumber and then let them sit for a while. It's because the longer the sit, they sit, the more nutritional value they lose. On the flip side, you know, there's a con to everything. While they're sitting there losing that nutritional value, they're susceptible to attack unless we do something to stop it. And by we, I mean the people cutting and prepping this lumber, not pest control professionals. There's nothing that we can do to really help in, in this stage of the process. This is all happening prior to uh, the pest control company ever actually getting involved. So, oh, what? What's that? Oh, you were just axing me about the last factor, the type of cut. See what I did there? Ax, haha, uh -huh. punny. All right. When we cut lumber from a tree, of course, the rings get cut. I already told you that. Now, if you look at the edge of this piece of wood, you would see the actual semicircles of the rings being cut. If we look at this piece of lumber, we kind of see these rings long and drawn out. So imagine taking a circle and you know, a bunch of circles stacked up on top of each other uh, in like a, like this cup and cutting it. If you were to look right here, you are right here, sorry, you would see all the semicircles of the ring. But if we were to cut it this way, those rings would kind of be long and drawn out. And that's what you're seeing right here. And so from that, we can differentiate one of two things. Is it what they call spring wood or is it what they call summer wood? So spring wood is denoted up here in red and I'll tell you a little bit more about it in a minute. And summer wood is up here in purple. So when you were to add, look at the actual growth rings of a tree, let me go back to that slide for just a moment. And this slide actually is better. So this lighter colored stuff in here, this is the spring wood. Uh, the outer darker part of the rings is the summer wood. That's when the tree is going through its seasons. So the start of the ring ends when the spring wood starts and the summer wood stops. And that ring ends when the next set of summer wood starts and so on and so on and so on. And that's how we get the growth rings of a tree is spring wood versus summer wood. All right. So what is spring wood? Spring wood is much softer, much more fibrous, made of larger cells and easier to eat. And that's why most WDOs attack it. It has the highest nutritional value of that piece of lumber. Now, it's definitely not possible just to build a, a piece of lumber out of strictly spring wood or strictly summer wood because that would be like taking an individual ring and turning it into a piece of lumber. That'd be itty bitty teeny tiny when you think about how small tree rings are. Uh, on the flip side, summer wood is harder, more compact, made of smaller cells and harder to eat. 
So when you think about wood destroying organisms, most wood destroying organisms that are present are actually feeding on spring wood. Uh, that's the very reason that when we deal with subterranean termites, we get that notebook paper like effect. What they're actually doing is they're eating all the spring wood and they're leaving that summer wood behind. And so that's why we get the galleries through the piece of wood and we're dealing with subterranean termites. Now, when we're dealing with something like dry wood termites, when they're pulling all the moisture that they can out of the wood and they're using dry structural sound wood for a food source, they don't care if it's spring wood or summer wood. Uh, that's why dry woods will eat both. They eat what we call across the grain. They eat those big pockets of you know, damage and they pack them full of their fecal pellets and things like that. It doesn't matter to them whether it's spring wood or soft wood because they get the same nutritional value out of it either way. And so we have to keep that in mind when we're dealing with certain wood destroying organisms. When we look at the damage that these organisms are doing, a lot of times that can kind of help us figure out what species of you know, wood destroying organism we're dealing with. So if we have big pockets that go across spring wood or summer wood, uh, that's probably dry wood termites. If we have just you know, galleries cut in the wood, that's probably subterranean termites. And as we start going through these wood destroying beetles, you'll actually see some of these same factors start to come into play. All right, so now that you know the factors that influence WDOs, let's discuss the beetles. All right, not those beetles. We, we're gonna talk about the wood destroying beetles. Uh, so here we have John Lennon, Paul McCartney, Ringo Starr, and George Harrison, uh, also known as lictids, anobeids, bostrichids, and old house borers. And I'm gonna go more in depth about each one of these beetles. And I know these photos make these beetles look huge because, of course, they're blown up so you can actually see what they look like. Uh, but a lictid, if you were to look at it, would not be so clear to the naked eye. It was teeny tiny and you'd have a hard time telling what it was without some sort of aid like a magnifying glass, a hand lens, microscope, something of the sort. So lictid powder post beetles, a common name for lictid powder post beetles is true powder post beetles. And I feel that's kind of a, a misnomer or misnaming, if you will. Uh, so when we think of powder post beetles in the pest control industry, and most people, when they think about powder post beetles, they think about, oh no, my crawl space is being infested. My crawl space is being attacked. That is not where lictids are going to be. And so that's why I think that's a misnomer. When we say true powder post beetle, that makes me think, oh, that's the powder post beetle that's going to be in my crawl space. It is the one true powder post beetle. And that's really not the case. And so I dislike the common name. Uh, now, they were referred to as lictid powder post beetles. They used to be in the family lictidae. Now they're in the family bostricidae, or now bostricids. We still call them lictid powder post beetles. Uh, they're in the lictinae subfamily of, you know, anybody's nerdy and cares. Uh, but they're actually not in that family anymore. Uh, they do commonly emerge in the winter, so they do emerge when it's colder, and that just has to do with their life cycle. It's typically around one year long, the life cycle being the time it takes them to go from egg to larva. All of their larval instars, remember that's the time period between molts, so once it turns into a larva, it hatches from an egg, that's its first instar. The entire time it's in that stage, it's still a first instar larva. Then it molts, it goes through metamorphosis, and they have complete metamorphosis. And after it molts, that's its second instar larva. And the process continues, it goes through multiple instars. Then it does something called pupating. We know that pupation is part of the complete metamorphosis process. And what pupation actually is, is a resting period. So insects go into a, a sense of hibernation and it's called diapause. And so what diapause is, is it's, it's like an arrested development. And what happens is while they're in that puparium or the outer casing of the pupil shell, uh, they are actually rearranging their biological uh, makeup and their, their structural makeup. And they're turning in from, they are turning into a beetle from a little larva. And so when we think about flies or, or butterflies, they go from a worm or a caterpillar type design into something with six legs, full-blown wings, well-developed mouth parts, antenna, things like that. And you, you have to imagine, wow, that's a very drastic change. And so they need that resting period in order to undergo such a drastic change. And so that's where we get uh, the, the puparium or the pupa stage. And then of course they emerge as the adult. Now the adult stage is where they're gonna reproduce and die. Only adult insects of any type of metamorphosis are able to reproduce and continue on our infestation. And lictid adults 
are not the most efficient at finding each other after they emerge. Uh, so reinfestation by lichted powder post beetles in hardwood floors is possible, but it's not common. And that's because the adults have a, such a hard time finding each other. Uh, so a lot of different factors play into that. One, they're itty bitty. And so remember, everything communicates by pheromones. And so when an adult is ready to mate for lichtids, they release the, their sex pheromone, which says, hey, I'm ready to mate. I'm an adult. Let's mate. And then the female will go and lay her eggs and things like that. Well, if they're really far apart, they may not be able to sense each other's pheromones. Uh, if they emerge at different times, the female emerges first, and then the male emerges, they may not ever find each other. And if they're in a long piece of you know, hardwood flooring, uh, they could emerge at different times. And so the chance of reinfestation, especially if that, that hardwood flooring has a varnish or a sealant on it or something like that, is low. Uh, and another way that you can you know, find or you know, determine, I guess I should say, that you have lichted powder post beetles is by looking at their antenna. Uh, they have what's called clubbed antenna, and it's a two-segmented club. So if you look right up here at the very tip of this lichtid's antenna, you can see the one, two large clubs, the enlarged sections of the antenna. Now, you wouldn't be able to tell that with your naked eye for sure, and it's actually kind of hard to tell even with a hand lens. Usually a microscope is best for looking at the antenna of lichtid powder post beetles. And then pictured here is the southern lictus beetle. Uh, the velvety powder post beetle is another type of, of lichtid that might get in hardwood floors around this area. And, uh, you know, I just chose the one that was, was easier to find. So, all right, so little lichtids like hard wood. That's how I remember what lichtid beetles attack. They strictly eat hardwood. They don't care about softwood. And so uh, that is my little, you know, alliteration minus hardwood. That doesn't start with an L, but to remember what lichtids eat. Little lichtids like hard wood. The exit holes for lichtid beetles are teeny tiny, 1 32nd to 1 16 of an inch in diameter or across the entire circle. Uh, that is really small. And if you remember, termites only need 1 32nd of an inch to enter a building. Uh, so think about how small a termite is, and that's how small the exit hole of the lichtid beetles can be. I mean, it's teeny tiny. We're talking about a minute little hole that you may not even notice on a giant, vast wooden floor. Uh, now, this piece of limb that was damaged by lichted powder post beetles, of course, you can see all the emergence holes. But imagine this hole right here under my little laser pointer in a giant hardwood floor. You may not notice that you have a lichted infestation. Uh, new damage will be covered in piles of fine for us. And that's really one of the only ways we know whether a lichtid infestation is active or not. If we go in and look at somebody's hardwood floors and all the emergence holes have little, they call halos, call them halos of frass, little circles of poop or frass around the outside of them, then the infestation's active. Now, if the customer just vacuumed, they walked through the area, they cleaned it up, they dusted, whatever, of course, that's going to disturb that frass and we're not going to know whether the infestation's active or inactive. Uh, if you were to touch that frass, it actually feels like baby powder. Uh, so you pick it up, and if you were to rub it th between your fingers, it would sound really weird, but that's one of the best ways to tell what wood-destroying organism you're dealing with when it comes to beetles. It would be like taking baby powder and rubbing it between your fingers. It's, it's almost soft or uh, silky to the touch. And this beetle, like I said, will not readily re reinfest. Uh, so what happens a lot of times when reinfestation does occur is this piece of wood, if it was a hardwood floor, would be sealed. And the only way that beetle can get back into that piece of wood is by entering through its old emergence hole. And so the beetles will mate, the lichtid will lay her eggs in one of the old emergence holes, and the reinfestation gets restarted. Like I said, sealing hardwood floors is one of the best things that you can do to stop lichtid infestations. All right, so the larva. Let's talk about the larval stage. So this is what the lichtid larva would look like. It is one-fourth of an inch long, so it's a quarter of an inch. Uh, and a lot of wood-destroying organisms, the larvae actually tend to be bigger than the adults, uh, which is kind of a, you know, just a fun fact to know. Uh, the moisture requirements, so I told you they have very low moisture requirements. They need between 6 and 30% moisture content. That's dependent upon the species. So different species are going to need different moisture content. Uh, but 6 to 30% in order to survive. If you remember, when we consider wood to be construction grade, it's between 8 to 12% moisture content. 
well, 8 to 12 percent is in between 6 to 30. And so that's why lictids are so, you know, common in hardwood floors is that wood doesn't have enough of the moisture removed in order to keep lictids from getting inside. Uh, the larvae are what's called C-shaped. So by some stretch of the imagination, you were able to actually find lictid larvae, which would be really hard to do. But let's just say you did it. They would look like little C's. Uh, the larvae do have legs with well-developed claws. Uh, so if you were to put this under the microscope on the end of the legs, you would notice what they call tarsal claws. The tarsal claw is just the last part of the leg segment. You would notice well-developed tarsal claws on the end of their legs. Uh, but like I said, the larvae, excuse me, larvae are seldom seen. Uh, the adults are more commonly seen, but it's also really hard to find adults because you're talking about something that is the size of a pinhead, a little bit bigger, crawling around on a giant hardwood floor. It's not really going to go, you're not really going to notice it. It's not going to go uh, all around the house where you're going to find them. They're going to end up dying somewhere around the, the outskirts of the house or on that hardwood floor, and they're just going to be lost to the world. Uh, now, if you have lighter colored hardwood, hardwood floors, it would be easier to notice the beetles than if you had a darker colored hardwood floor. Uh, but I don't think anybody's going around just examining their hardwoods unless they notice piles of frass or tons and tons of damage like you see here in their hardwood flooring. So uh, I told you I was going to tell you more about lictids earlier. So I actually have some uh, pet lictids, for lack of a better word. Uh, this is a little Christmas tree. I should have taken a picture of the whole structure. I didn't think about it. But it's just a, it's a Christmas tree that's been built out of pallet wood. And the idea behind it is somebody gave this to my wife and I uh, about two years ago now. And on the Christmas tree, on the, the front of it, there's little shelves that have been built. And those shelves were designed for you to put knickknacks on and things like that. Uh, well, like I said, about two Christmases ago, uh, we had this on the landing in our stairwell. I was going upstairs to go to bed, and I noticed a pile of frass on one of the shelves. And I was like, oh, I must have knocked some sawdust out of this Christmas tree when I was, you know, putting it up. And I went on to bed, didn't think anything about it. I wiped it away, you know, cleaned it up with a damp cloth and didn't think anything about it. Well, I went back like, two weeks later and I noticed a larger pile of sawdust and a couple of beetles. And I was like, huh, that's pretty cool. There's little beetles on the tree. And, you know, I never even thought about it. And I was like, that's, that's unique. And I cleaned away the sawdust again. And then it hit me like three days later. I was like, wait a minute. There's beetles on this this hardwood tree that's you know built out of pallet wood, which is made out of hardwood. It's not pressure treated. It probably just came straight from whatever factory recycled it and was built into this structure. I was like, I bet it has lictids. So I put it out in my garage, and sure enough, two years later, you can see all the different emergence holes. You can see massive piles of sawdust, and this is just two of the shelves with the most amount of sawdust. Uh, if you look at some of the other shelves that are on it, uh, there are other smaller piles. And then you can actually see the sawdust streaming out of the little holes. And then if you look on this shelf, you can see different dead beetles sitting on the shelf. Now, my family sees this, my wife sees this, and they all freak out. They're like, are you crazy? You have a wood-destroying organism in your garage that you are keeping as pets. And then I have to tell them, well, our house is built out of a soft wood. And lichens don't eat soft woods, so we don't really have anything to worry about. We have hardwood floors, but the chance of the lichens finding their way through my house into the hardwood floors is very slim. And at that, my hardwood floors are stained. And so there's not really any way for them to infest my hardwood floors, so it's no real danger to keep these. And so I'm just kind of keeping these as my experiment. I want to see the amount of damage that they'll do to this tree over time. Uh, and I try to keep my garage warm enough so that they don't die, though with the freezing weather that we've had uh, you know, so early in the season, I don't know if they're going to survive past this year. Uh, but pretty cool. If anybody else wants to see any more photos of this, let me know. I'll take some more and show you. Of course, my wife's upset because her you know, Christmas tree decoration is destroyed, and I think it's the coolest thing in the world because I'm some weird nerdy entomologist. So here we are. All right, what can we do? Honestly, not very much. If we're dealing with lictid powder host beetles, they're a cosmetic or an aesthetic issue. They're not a structural concern, and there's not much we need to do about them. Now, back in the day, way, way on back, like 1800s, sometimes hardwoods were used as a building construction material. 
in that instance, yes, we would need to do something to remedy the situation. And I'll talk more about that when we talk about anabeads. In terms of lictids in a hardwood floor or a piece of furniture, there's not a lot we can do. Uh, for beetles and hardwood floors, the homeowner can try to do the following things. They can replace the infested floorboards. Uh, so they know what floorboards are infested. A lot of times it's, it's very isolated which floorboards are, are actually infested with beetles. They could have those pulled up and removed. If it's a newer built house, uh, they could petition the builder and say, hey, you sold me infested wood. You need to replace my floorboards, but they're not going to get any backing from the pest control company. That's you know, something they'd have to do on their own. Uh, never suggest that it's the builder's fault. You know, We don't want to throw a liability on anybody. You could just say, hey, you could try talking to the builder. Uh, they could let the beetles emerge, you know, no harm, no foul. They could then use a stain, varnish, sealant, or paint on their hardwood floors, and they really wouldn't have anything to worry about. The beetles wouldn't be able to reinfest. And uh, a lot of wood, I told you all, like you know, wood-destroying fungus, a lot of times, pecky rot and pocket rot and stuff like that, are used to give that rustic look or rustic feel. A lot of times, wood floors that have been damaged by wood-destroying organisms when they were still trees or saplings, and the tunnels and galleries get cut, and there's holes all in it, it, it's used as rustic flooring anyway. And so it, it gives that, that wood flooring the rustic look or the rustic feel. So uh, really they're not losing out on anything and they can ensure that their hardwood floors aren't going to get any more damage uh, by using that stain, varnish, or sealant. And what that does is even if there's already a stain on it, all those newly emerged beetles form holes. And when you reseal it, all those holes get sealed so they can't go back and just lay their eggs in their old emergence holes and they don't really have a way to get in. And then they could fumigate or heat treat, but that's really not worth the cost. I mean, when you think about, I don't know, a twenty to $40,000 fumigation, depending on the size of the house, uh, to kill some beetles that will emerge on their own and then you can just seal your floor and nobody would be the wiser, it's really not smart to fumigate or heat treat your entire house. Plus, Active doesn't actually do fumigations. so. There's that. There's a lot of liability associated with fumigations, so not the best option. And then if you did have beetles in some sort of sentimental furniture or really expensive furniture, uh, fumigation or heat are really the only options. Uh, so, you know, not much we need to do about cosmetic or aesthetic concerns. And beard powder post beetles. So and beard powder post beetles, a common name, furniture or death watch beetles. Uh, their family is no longer anabeady. It's now... A different family, don't worry about any of that. That's not relevant to anything that we do. Uh, the adults are one eighth to one half inch long, and they commonly emerge between April and June. These are the beetles that are going to be in our crawl space. Uh, when you look at the adults from above, you know, from on top, their head is concealed by what's called their pronotum. That's just the first area right behind the head, and their head is pointed downward. This is their head, and this is their pronotum. And you can see that if you were to look at that beetle from above, you wouldn't be able to see its head. Uh, there are a ton of different species that we can deal with, uh, depending on what area of Georgia you're in or what area of the United States you're in. And each one of them is going to do a different amount of damage based on all of the different factors that we talked about. And they have between a two to 10 year life cycle, with the average being two to three years. Somewhere in the two year range is the uh, average life cycle of anabeid powder post beetles. And remember, that is from egg to adult, how long does that take? Uh, now, be careful. These beetles are commonly confused with uh, drugstore or cigarette beetles. I actually uh, went to Bugwood. You can see that's where a lot of these images are from that I credited. And one of the uh, contributors on Bugwood actually put anabeid powder post beetle damage into the site and listed it as drugstore beetle damage. That's not possible. Drugstore beetles are a stored product pest. Uh, they will be in like flour and things like that. They are definitely not going to do wood damage to the wooden members of a crawl space. And so I reached out to them and, you know, told them, I'm like, hey, I think this is misnamed and, you know, misidentified, things like that. And they had identified it based off the beetles. And they misidentified the beetles, so they misidentified the damage. All right, so anabeid beetle damage. Uh, they will damage hard or soft wood, depending on the species, but soft wood is going to be our focus because, again, that's what our crawl space is made from. Uh, they prefer older aged wood, which is kind of contrary to most other insects. Uh, the nutritional value of older aged wood is perfect for anabeid beetles. Uh, one kind of characteristic of anabeid powder post beetles is that the frass is tightly packed in their galleries. 
So if you were to bust open one of these galleries and look at it, there would be a, a fine gritty frass. Almost imagine taking like sandpaper and grinding it up in a blender. And it's got like that gritty sandy feel to it, that rough texture. Uh, and it streams down the wood when they emerge. Or uh, sometimes not even when they emerge, they'll, they'll just kick it out because their galleries are so full they can no longer get through them. And you have the frass streaming down the wood. And if you were to look at the floor underneath this wooden member of the cross face, you would see piles of dead frass feces all over the floor. Uh, their exit holes are between 1 16th and 1 8th of an inch long, uh, somewhere in the middle usually. 1 16th is pretty small, 1 8th is pretty large. Uh, here is, I guess, a wooden pillar, it looks like, that was kind of cut into a cross section. And you can see all the damage that they've done. These are all the galleries of those Anabia beetles. And some of these would be a little bit bigger than their actual emergent ho emergence holes. These would be the actual galleries inside the interior of the wood. And the emergence holes would be a little bit smaller on the outside portion that was actually cut away. So the larva. Uh, Anabia beetle larva is about half an inch long, a little bit smaller on average, but up to half an inch. They need between 13 and 30% moisture. And so that's why removing moisture is so important. Remember, at 28% moisture, we can start getting wood decaying fungi. Well, if we have wood decaying fungi, that can also help serve as a uh, food source for certain wood destroying beetles. Uh, and you could have anabeids, you could have wood decaying fungi, you could have old house spores, and you could have termites all at the same house, all using the same moisture source. So. Moisture is very important when dealing with destroying beetles. Uh, the larvae possess what they, they call teeth on the mandibles. Uh, they are C-shaped and they are very seldom seen. Uh, the adults are more commonly seen, but it's also kind of hard to find anabeid adults. A lot of times if you have uh, some glue boards in the crawl space, you may catch a couple, uh, but it is rare to catch anabeid adults. You're really gonna see that frass streaming down the wood. And that's gonna be your telltale sign of a state. What can we do for an infested uh, crawl space if it's isolated to just the crawl space? First and foremost, we got to correct the moisture. Uh, as required by the department bag, we have to cover at least 70% of the moist or soil uh, with a moisture barrier or some other similar sheeting, and we have to make sure ventilation standards are met. In addition to that, if it's uh, any anobeid beetle infestation or other wood destroying beetle infestation, we must also apply a pesticide per its label instructions. That again is required by the Department of Ag. It's one of the rules and regs. Uh, borates are a great choice for that or sometimes other conventional insecticides, you know, like bifenthrin um, being a conventional insecticide, not necessarily. Hey, why didn't, it, didn't they change that to 90 percent, the moisture barrier instead of 70? Uh, for certain. 90. For certain standards, but I believe as of 2018, the most current one is still 70. For, I want to say ventilation standard one, I'd have to pull up the standards and actually look at them. Or if Ryan Streeter's on here, he may know off the top of his head. But active standards 90, just because you need okay. less cross ventilation with it. But Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so what are the infestations not isolated to the crawl space? If it's an infestation that's smaller, isolated elsewhere in the house, uh, required by the Department of Ag, we must use pesticide per its, per its label instructions. Of course, we can't really control moisture in areas that are not the crawl space. And if the infestation is not small or isolated, then fumigation tends to be the best option. Remember, fumigation is still not perfect. Uh, fumigant won't penetrate wet wood. Uh, so nothing is foolproof, but fumigation would give you, I guess, the best best opportunity or best chance at, at killing off the beetles entirely. Uh, now. Well, Yes. You want me to answer that question about the vapor barrier? Please, by all means, yes. Um, for the, the, the rules and regs state 70%. However, when correcting inadequate ventilation, 90% is required. So uh -huh. in effect, in the field, when we're talking about doing a vapor barrier, we shouldn't ever consider doing one less than 90% because if it's less than that, it doesn't meet the state standard for adequate ventilation. Right, yeah, or you have to have more vents to meet that standard, right? Like, you can meet it if... Yeah, you're more but it, you can, right? with, but yeah. you have to have a lot more vents. In practice, right. the easiest way to meet the standard is to have cross-ventilation and 90% soil coverage. 
Yeah, and so, yeah, just to explain, like, if you had 70% coverage, say you'd need 20 vents versus 90% coverage, you'd only need two vents, and you would have cross-ventilation standards met. And so, it, yeah, it's just easier to, to get that, to meet that standard using 90% coverage instead of 70. Or, um, you know, other, other options, so. Uh, bus straight kids, I'm going to run through very quickly because we're almost out of time. Long story short, they're not a huge issue in crawl spaces. They're going to be more in uh, furniture and things like that. And they are really just kind of an incidental pest. Uh, they have a bumpy pronotum or area right behind the head as compared to anabeids, which is nice and smooth. <laughs> All right. So uh, if you were to look at the antenna of this beetle, it would be clubbed like the lictid, but it would have three large segments at the end. And there's actually a type of bostricid that can bore through the lead sheathing of aerial telephone cables. It's called the lead cable borer. If you want to know more about that later, hit me up and we'll talk about it. It's pretty cool. Uh, but remember, they'll attack hard or soft wood. Again, soft wood would be our focus if they were in something like a crawl space. Uh, they do not usually reinfest, though they can. Uh, the frass would be tightly packed into their galleries, which you can see here. Uh, and it's a very coarse. It's even more coarse than that of the anobeids. Again, they attack furniture, and their exit holes are between one-eighth and three-eighths of an inch. I went through those very quickly because there's one other pest here that I would like to get to, and that is the old house borer. Now, I'm going to have to run through this quickly, but this is something that we we'll definitely need to be on the lookout for. Uh, they're in the family called Cerambicity. The adults are one inch in length, and they are the largest of all wood-destroying beetles. Uh, you can tell an old house borer from some of the other cerambicids, which also attack wood, by looking for two large bumps on the pronotum of the beetle. We call that the owl face. Uh, you, you can kind of see an eye, an eye, and a little beak. And they're covered in these little gray setae or hairs. Uh, they have an oval-shaped exit hole. So the old house borer has the oval exit hole. They both stem off the O. And they need about 13% moisture in order to be present. So remember, molds and mildews start forming at 20%. And I told you we should not have the term mold or mildew in our vocabulary. That's indication of a moisture issue. Well, if mold or mildew were present, old house borers could most certainly be present. Actually, any of the wood-destroying beetles we've talked about could be present in that crawl space. Uh, egg hole, like I said, one four to three eighths in inches in diameter, and they are oval-shaped. So here's your oval-shaped exit hole. Here are some others. Uh, old house borer damage from the larva. So remember, they only attack soft wood. They do not attack hard woods. They commonly reinfest, and they have frass tightly packed into their galleries. Uh, their frass is fine and powdery, kind of like that of the lictid, uh, but it also has these barrel shaped, it almost looks like somebody took Rice Krispie treats and cut the ends off. Uh, they have these barrel shaped pieces mixed in with their fine powdery frass, which you see right here. Uh, they cause a rippled or washboard effect on the wood that they're damaging. And that's from their feeding behavior and the way that they feed. You can see these little ripples uh, going across this piece of wood. And their name is kind of a misnomer. While they're called the old house borer, they actually damage wood that's newer, uh, usually less than five years old. Uh, the larvae are between one and a quarter and one and a half inches long. So the larvae are actually larger than the adults. Uh, you can tell it's an old house borer larva by looking at the ocelli, which is just a simple eye that insects have. It's a light sensing eye. And what it tells them is how close to the surface of the wood they are uh, in a line behind their mouth parts. So see one, two, three. There's the three ocelli in a line behind their mouth parts. Uh, their larvae are called round headed borers from their shape. So they have a more rounded shaped head that then tapers into this long slender body as compared to bucrested or jewel beetles, which are, excuse me, kind of flat and uniform all the way, all the way down. Uh, the larva and adults are both seldom seen. So the adults are very short lived, only a few days. And so it's really hard to find old house borer or adults and even larva, really you're gonna find their damage. You're gonna do your sounding or probing, bust into one of their galleries and all that for us and all shale is start raining. Uh, now, I am just about out of time here, so very quickly, uh, old house borer is actually a protein requirements. If you have wood-destroying fungus, that can actually act as a protein source. The larvae have to have at least 0.2% protein uh, in order to develop properly, and so it can take larvae up to 15 years to emerge as adults, usually because of lack of protein in the wood. Uh, and wood-decaying fungi 
or other types of fungi can actually serve as that protein source, and so that's why that's important. Uh, what can we do? Well, burning the house down is 100% effective. I'm just kidding, mostly. Uh, some, same standards as anabead powder post beetles, and if you want the best chance of success, fumigation, of course, would render you the best results, but again, that's not always perfect. A useful life hack that Run and Kill taught me, so if you use an ink pen like this one right here, retractable ink pen, lictids would be somewhere between this point and the, the point of the pen, anabeads, the, the damage, so if you were to stick this in the damage, the, the exit holes, anabeads would go in this far, and strictids would go in up this far. Uh, other non-infesting insects, I'm just going to show you all these photos and then we'll end it. There's other serambicids that you might deal with. These are not reinfesting, so you don't have to worry about these causing an infestation. And then, of course, you have your bucrestid beetles. Uh, within bucrestids, emerald ash borer is a very serious pest of live trees, but is not going to do structural damage to your home. They do cosmetic damage, much like carpenter bees. And with that, any questions?